Every Japanese fighter pilot carried with him four pieces of triangular bandage in the pockets of his flight suit. I pulled one out and tried to moisten it with saliva by biting the end. I had absolutely no saliva in my mouth. I was terribly thirsty. My mouth felt dry like cotton. I kept biting and chewing. The end of the bandage slowly became damp. Leaning forward to get away from the steady wind pressure, I wiped my left eye with the moistened bandage. It worked. Little by little my vision cleared, and in less than a minute I could make out clearly the ends of my wings. I sighed with relief, only for seconds. As I sat back, I felt a stabbing pain in my head, then another. The pain came and went in waves. For moments I would feel nothing, then a shock as if a blunt-edged hammer had struck me against the skull. I wasted no time in applying the bandage to the head wound, but as soon as I took my hand away, the wind snatched the bandage and whipped it away through the shattered glass. Despair swept over me. How was I to get a bandage around my head? I had to stop the bleeding. My left hand was useless, and I could use only my right in applying the bandage. But my right hand was necessary to hold the stick and to work the throttle. The shrieking wind in the cockpit further complicated the situation. I pulled free a second piece of bandage. No sooner had I laid it in my lap than it was blown away. The third and fourth went as quickly. What could I do? I was almost frantic. The pain in my head had increased. It was now a deep throbbing, each succeeding wave of agony more intense than before. I still had the silk muffler around my neck. I untied the knot and pressed one end beneath my right thigh, so that my weight would hold it down in the wind. Then I took out a jackknife, holding it in my teeth while I opened the blade. The muffler fluttered wildly in the wind. I held the knife in my right hand and transferred the end of the muffler to my teeth, then cut out a piece. The wind blew it away. Again I cut the muffler, and again the shrieking wind tore it out of the cockpit. I didn't know what to do. Despair returned. I searched frantically for a solution. There was only one piece of the muffler left. Of course I should have realised before, I bent forward to escape the wind, and began to squeeze the muffler below the edge of my helmet, working it up into the wound, nut I had to sit up to continue. The longer I remained leaning forward, the worse the pain became. Finally, I thrust the stick into the crook of my leg and steadied the airplane in this fashion. Then I leaned forward and moved the throttle all the way forward in its slot, holding it in position. When I pulled back with my leg, the zero rose steadily in a long climb. I didn't care how erratically I was flying, so long as I could control the airplane. At 1,500 feet, I eased off on the throttle and returned to level flying. Then I pulled the cushion loose from the seat so that I would be as low as possible in the cockpit to escape the wind blast. Wedging my leg tightly against the stick to hold the plane steady, I slipped out of the seat to my knees, wedging the cushion with my shoulder to act as a wind buffer. Slowly I managed to move the muffler further under my cap, pressing it against the wound. I have no idea how long it took me to do this, but it seemed forever. It was impossible to see out of the cockpit, and once the Zero jerked wildly and dropped off on one wing as I hit a violent updraft. If the airplane went out of control, I was lost. I couldn't touch the rudder bar at all. Finally I was through. The muffler was beneath my helmet and pressed tightly against the wound. I crawled back to my seat and brought the fighter back to an even level. My head felt better at once. The bleeding stopped. My feeling of relief after the strain of working the muffler into position was overpowering. Soon an overwhelming desire to sleep assailed me. I fought it desperately but could not shake it off. More than once I fell asleep, my chin resting against my chest. I shook my head, hoping the pain would keep me awake. But every thirty or forty seconds my shoulders jerked as I slipped against the straps. More than once I snapped awake to find the zero in an inverted position. Once I came to, flying upside down, and was so logy I failed to move the controls. In a few seconds the engine coughed alarmingly. It was enough to bring me awake, and I jerked the controls over to right the plane, the drowsiness shaking my head slower and slower. The wonderful, warm, comforting embrace of sleep. Everything was so peaceful. Wake up, wake up, I screamed to myself. Wake up! I came to with the zero skidding wildly to the right, the wings straight up and down. I had to stay awake. How? How to overcome the frantic urge to go to sleep? Not to succumb to it all, to forget everything in the wonderful peace of slumber.
It felt so good, so warm, so comfortable. The fighter jerked suddenly. I was upside down again. Stay awake, I shouted to myself. I became angry at my failure to resist the desire to sleep. I lifted my hand from the stick and struck myself on the cheek as hard as I could. Once, twice, three times, hoping the pain would jar me to full consciousness. I could not continue this indefinitely. Soon I tasted salt in my mouth. Blood spilled out on my lips and trickled down my chin. My cheek puffed up still more and became seriously bloated. It felt as though a giant rubber ball were expanding within my mouth. There was no alternative. I must continue to strike myself to stay awake. Perhaps food would help overcome the drowsiness. I took my lunchbox and gulped down several mouthfuls of fish cakes. I was as sleepy as ever. I ate some more, chewed it carefully, then swallowed. In a moment I was violently ill. The plane heeled over out of control as spasms of nausea racked my body. Everything came up, spewing over my legs and the instrument panel. I was nearly insane with the stabbing pains from my head. Even this sudden new agony failed to keep me awake. Again and again I struck my cheek with my fist until I no longer had any sensation there. In desperation I banged my hand down on top of my head, but to no avail I wanted to sleep. Oh, to go to sleep, to forget everything, to know that the slumber would never end. Delightful, warm sleep, the zero reeled and lurched no matter what I did, I could not keep the wings level. I seemed to hold the stick in one position, and never realised when my hand dropped to the left or right, sending the plane over in a wild skidding turn, I was ready to give up. I knew I could not continue on like this, but I swore I would not go out like a coward, merely diving the plane into the ocean for one bright flash of pain, and then nothing. If I must die, at least I could go out as a samurai. My death would take several of the enemy with me, a ship, I needed an enemy ship. Out of an overwhelming despondency, I turned the zero and headed back toward Guadalcanal. Several minutes later my head cleared. No drowsiness, no overwhelming pain. I could not understand it. Why dive to my death now if I could reach Buka or even Rabaul? I turned the fighter again and headed north. In a few minutes the desire to sleep engulfed me once more. I became groggy. Everything seemed to swirl around. What was I doing, flying north, an enemy ship? I remembered now. I must find an enemy ship and dive. Crash into it at full speed, kill as many of the enemy's men as I could. The world was misty. Everything dissolved into a haze. I must have turned back to Guadalcanal five times, and as many times reversed my course for Rabul. I began to shout to myself over and over again I was determined to stay awake. I yelled and shrieked, stay awake. Gradually the urge to sleep diminished. I was on the way back to Rabaul, but merely flying north was no guarantee I would ever reach my home base. I had no idea of my position. All I knew was that I was flying in the general direction of Rabaul. I was at a considerable distance north of Guadalcanal, but did not know exactly how far away. I searched the sea, but found none of the islands in the chain which stretches up to Rabaul. With only my right foot working the rudder bar, it was probable that I had edged toward the eastern part of the Solomons. I drew the ocean chart from beneath my seat. It was smeared with blood, and it took me several minutes of spitting on the map and rubbing it against my suit to clear some of the blood away. But for the moment it was no help. I tried to orient myself by the sun's position in the sky. Thirty minutes passed, and still no islands appeared. What was wrong? Where was I? The sky was absolutely clear, and the ocean stretched without a break to the horizon. Something was lifting me up from my seat, was I in a downdraft? Everything felt so strange, I was upside down again, and did not realise the plane had rolled around until my body tugged at the seat belt. Slowly I regained normal position, something flashed beneath the wings. What could that be? I looked down, it was just a blur, something dark, stretching endlessly just below the fighter, the water. I was almost in the water. In panic I leaned forward and shoved at the throttle, the next moment hauling back on the stick. The Zero responded with a rapid climb to 1,500 feet. I throttled back and went on at minimum cruising speed, an island. Dead ahead, an island, it was on the horizon, looming out of the water. Elated, I laughed loudly to myself. I would be all right now, I could get my position and be sure I was heading for Rabul.
I went on and on, anxious for a close look at the coastline. The island failed to appear. Where was it? Was I having hallucinations? What was the matter with me? The island passed to my right, a low-hanging cloud. Again I tried to read the compass. It was still blurred. I spit on my hand and rubbed my left eye. Still I could not read the dial. I leaned as far forward as possible, my nose almost against the glass at last I could see. The reading shocked me. I was holding a 330-degree heading. No wonder I had not seen any islands for nearly two hours. The zero was moving out to the centre of the Pacific Ocean. I took out the chart again and estimated my position as 60 miles northeast of the Solomons. It was only a guess, but the best I could do. I made a 90-degree turn to the left and headed for what I hoped would be New Ireland, which is just northeast of New Britain and Rabul. Again and again the waves of drowsiness assailed me. I lost count of how many times the plane dropped off on a wing, or how many times I frantically brought the zero out of inverted flight. I staggered through the sky, leaning down often to check the compass reading, and yanking the stick over until I was back on what I hoped was my heading for New Ireland. The head pains increased and helped to keep me awake. Then I was suddenly shocked to full consciousness. Without any warning, the engine went dead. There was a strange hissing sound, and then only the shriek of the wind ripping into the cockpit. Instinctively, I shoved the stick forward to gain speed. This way I'd keep from stalling out, and the propeller would continue revolving. I made every move with a deftness which, when I thought about it later, was startling. The mind adapts itself to such emergencies perfectly. I knew, even without thinking about it, that the main fuel tank had been drained. I had one tank left, but only a short time in which to transfer the fuel feed. I must be quick and sure when I changed the fuel supply cock. Normally I had no difficulty in manipulating the cock with my left hand, but now it was paralysed. I had to do it with my right hand. I reached across my body, not far. Enough, I strained. Still my hand would not reach the other side of the cockpit, the zero dropped slowly toward the ocean, gliding without a tremor. I jerked my arm forward with all my strength and opened the fuselage tank. The fuel would not suck through. The automatic pump leading to the feed lines had been sucking air for too long, and the lines were dried out. I reached for the emergency hand pump and worked it savagely. There was so little time left, the pump worked at once, with a satisfying roar, the engine burst into life and the zero surged forward. I wasted no time in going back to 1,500 feet. All my months of training for overwater flights now came to my help. I had once established a record in the Navy for flying with a lower fuel consumption than any pilot. If I kept going now at the minimum possible consumption I could get from the airplane, I had perhaps one hour and 45 minutes left in the air. I adjusted the propeller pitch and throttled back to only 1,700 revolutions per minute. I adjusted the fuel-air mixture to the absolute minimum to keep the engine from stalling. The Zero flew on slowly. I had less than two hours in which to reach a Japanese-occupied island. Less than two hours to live if I failed. Another hour passed. Nothing met my eyes in the vast ocean and the blue sky. Suddenly I sighted something on the water, an atoll. No mistake this time, no cloud in front of me, it was definitely an island. Its shape became apparent as I drew closer. Green Island, the horseshoe-shaped coral reef which I had noticed on the way to Guadalcanal. I checked the island against the map, hope leapt within me. I was only sixty miles from Rabul. Sixty miles normally, only a brief hop, but now conditions were anything but normal. My situation could not have been worse. I had enough fuel left for only 40 minutes of additional flight. The Zero had been shot up badly, and the drag of the smashed cockpit, as well as the metal skin which had been chewed up by bullets, seriously affected the airplane's speed. I had been badly wounded, and was still partially paralysed. My right eye was totally blind, and the left eye none too good. I was exhausted, and it took all my effort to keep the plane on an even keel, another island, dead ahead. This time it was no cloud looming on the horizon. I recognised the mountains. This was New Ireland. No mistake about it. I knew that if I could cross the peaks, which reached to a height of 2,400 feet, I could make Rabul. It seemed as if I faced an endless series of obstacles before. I could reach my home base. Thick clouds gathered around the peaks, and a violent rain squall lashed the mountains and the island. 
It seemed impossible to get through, exhausted physically and mentally, half blind, and in a badly damaged fighter, how could I get through a squall which was extremely dangerous even under normal conditions? I had no choice but to detour. It was a bitter decision, for the fuel gauge dropped lower and lower. I had only minutes left in the air, I bit my lips and turned to the south. The plane moved slowly down the George Channel between Rabool and New Ireland, two foaming wakes in the water slipped beneath the wings. Soon I saw two warships, heavy cruisers by their looks, steaming south under full speed. They were making more than thirty knots, headed for Guadalcanal. I almost wept at the sight of the Japanese warships. I felt like ditching the plane right then and there one of the cruisers could swing around and pick me up. My hope was fast running out on me. Rabool seemed a million miles away. I circled once over the two warships, ready to descend for a water landing. I could not bring myself to do it. The two cruisers were on their way to the fighting off Guadalcanal. If they stopped to pick me up, which was questionable, their firepower would be delayed where it was urgently needed. There could be no ditching. I learned weeks later that the two cruisers were the Ioba and the Kinugasa, each of 9,000 tons. They had been making full steam, headed for Guadalcanal at more than 33 knots. Along with seven other warships, they stormed the Allied convoy at Lunga, sinking four enemy cruisers and damaging another cruiser and two destroyers. I turned again toward Rabaul. The fuel gauge showed barely twenty minutes of flight time remaining. If I failed to reach Rabaul, however, I would be able to crash land on the beach. Then the familiar volcano showed over the horizon. I had done it, Rabaul was in sight, I still had to land. It seemed an impossible undertaking with my left side so completely paralysed. I circled over the airfield, undecided, not knowing what to do. I didn't know that I had been given up for lost, that all the other planes, except for one shot down over Guadalcanal, had landed almost two hours ago. Lieutenant Sasai told me later he could not believe his eyes when he identified my zero through his binoculars. He screamed my name, and the pilots came running from all over the field. I couldn't see them from the air through my still-damaged left eye. All I saw was the narrow runway. I decided to ditch in the water just off the beach. The zero went down slowly. Eight hundred, seven, four, one, then I was only fifty feet above the water. I changed my mind again. The vision of the airplane crashing into the sea and my wounded head slamming forward was too much. I felt I would never live through the impact. I pulled up again and turned for the runway. If I concentrated, I felt I could make it. The fuel gauge was nearly at the bottom. I adjusted the propeller to its highest pitch, gunned the engine, and climbed back to 1,500 feet. It was now or never, the zero dropped down when I pushed the stick forward. I lowered the wheels, then the flaps, the airplane's speed dropped sharply. I watched the long lines of fighters parked on each side of the runway rushing up to me. I had to miss hitting the planes, bring her back, I was too far to the left and yanked back on the stick to go around again. After the fourth circle of the field, I went in for another landing attempt. Once I was in a glide, I lifted my right foot and switched the ignition off with the top of my boot. With even a drop of fuel in the tanks, the zero would explode if I crashed. The coconut trees on the edge of the field loomed before my eyes. I slipped over them, trying to judge my height by the treetops. Now I was over the runway there was a sharp jolt as the zero struck the ground. I pulled back on the stick and held it against the seat with all my strength to keep the plane from swerving. The zero rolled to a halt near the command post. I tried to grin, and a wave of blackness swept over me. I felt I was falling, tumbling end over end into a bottomless pit. Everything seemed to be spinning wildly. From a great distance I heard voices calling my name. They shouted Sakai, Sakai. I cursed to myself. Why didn't they keep quiet? I wanted to sleep. The blackness lifted. I opened my eyes and saw faces all around me. Was I dreaming, or was I really back at Rabul? I didn't know. Everything was so unreal. It was all a dream. I was sure it couldn't be true. Everything dissolved into waves of blackness and shouting voices. I tried to stand up. I gripped the edge of the cockpit and rose to my feet. It was Rabul. It was no dream after all. Then I collapsed, helpless. Strong arms reached in and lifted me from the airplane. I gave in. I didn't care any longer. I regained consciousness, staring up at the sky. Something jerked and shook my body. 
I turned and recognised Sasai and Nakajima. The two officers had climbed onto the Zero's wing and carried me down from the plane. Nishizawa's voice burst through the murmuring of the crowd which had gathered. Call a car, quick, he shouted. He raged at the orderlies, quick to the operating room. Go phone the chief surgeon, quickly, you slow son of a bitch. I couldn't go to the hospital, not yet. I must report to Captain Saito before anything else. We always reported to the command post. The need to turn in my report for the day clamoured urgently in my mind. I raised my right arm, protesting to Sasai and Nakajima to put me down. I have to report, I choked. Let me go to the command post, damn your duty, Nakajima thundered back at me. That can wait, we're taking you to the hospital, I insisted, and yelled that I had to turn in my report. The next moment Nishizawa stepped forward and grabbed me under the arm. Ota slipped along my left side, and the two pilots carried me into the command post. Nishizawa kept muttering, stupid bastard, doesn't even know what he looks like. Crazy, that's what he is. I hardly recall standing trying to stand before Captain Saito, who stared at me incredulously. I think I spoke to him, but everything began to black out again. All of a sudden I wanted to go to sleep, that was it, sleep. What was I doing here anyway? Then there was only blackness. Nishizawa and Ota carried me to the car, they told me later, waiting outside the command post. Nishizawa hurled the driver from the seat and slid behind the wheel, driving fast but carefully to avoid any bad bumps for the hospital. Sasai and Ota stayed with me in the back seat, supporting me. The chief surgeon was waiting for me in the operating room. He cut off my torn uniform and at once began to work on my wounds. Through my sleep I felt blinding stabs of pain from time to time as the doctor cut into my scalp. He saved two jagged pieces of 50 calibre bullets to show me later. I felt a knife blade scraping against my skull. I awoke almost as he finished. I stared up at him as he bent over me. My eyes, I remembered my eyes. Suddenly panic gripped me. My eyes, I shouted. Doctor, what about my eyes? You are seriously wounded, he replied. I can do nothing further for you here. He peered at my face closely. You'll have to be sent back to Japan where a specialist can work on you. A feeling of disaster engulfed me. I feared for my right eye. I could see nothing on that side. The thought of being blinded horrified me. I would be useless as a fighter pilot. But I had to fly. I had to fly fighters again. Four days passed slowly in the hospital. Bandages covered my body. The doctor withdrew four pieces of metal stuck in my flesh, as well as steel splinters from my cheeks. On the fourth day, I felt slight movement in my left hand and leg. The muscles barely twitched, but at least they moved. On the other hand, the head wound began to rot in the high tropical humidity, and my right eye remained blind. Meanwhile, the fighter sweeps and bombing raids against Guadalcanal continued without let-up. Every day I heard the thunder of the planes as they raced down the runways and took off for the distant battlefield. Rabul had its own daily visitors, the high-flying fortresses which attacked the two airfields. Every time the enemy bombers approached, I was carried to a shelter with the other patients. Each evening Sasai and Nakajima visited me. They suggested that I return to Japan. Only the temperate climate of the home islands and a leading specialist could cure my eye injuries, they said. I refused to go home. I was irrational and irritable. I insisted I could be cured right here at Rabul, that there was no reason why I couldn't be flying again in a few weeks. If I had only known, it is difficult to explain my feelings, my reluctance to leave the hellhole that was Rabaul. I realise now that I bordered on the hysterical from the nightmare prospect of having to end my career as a pilot. There was the matter of honour as well. I felt I was honour-bound to remain at Rabul as long as I could. Even if I could not fly, I could help the green pilots. I might be able to warn them of the mistakes which could cause their death. All the reasons melted into one. My return to Japan meant a final judgement by an eye specialist, and I feared and rebelled against what I might be told. Sasai and Nakajima abandoned their arguments. The matter was ended on the morning of August 11th, when Captain Saito, the commander of the Lei Wing, came to my bedside. He was as kind to me as he could possibly be, and equally adamant. I know how you feel, Sakai, he said, but I have taken all factors into consideration. My orders are that you will be sent home to Japan on rotation, 
and assigned to the Yokosuka Naval Hospital. You will leave tomorrow by transport plane. The surgeon has told me that your only hope lies with the doctors at Yokosuka. He smiled at me. Your going home will do as much for us as it will for you, Sakai. We will all know that the best medical care in Japan will be yours. He rose to his feet. For several moments he looked at me, then leaned down and placed his hand on my shoulder. You have done a marvellous job for all of us, Saburo, he said softly. Every man who has ever flown with you is proud to have known and to have fought with you. When your wounds are healed, come back to us. Then he walked away. That evening Sasai came to visit me. He was visibly tired from the day's mission over Guadalcanal. I told him of the orders sending me home the next day. In a little while all my old friends had assembled in the room for a modest farewell party. No one sang or talked loudly or cracked any jokes. We merely talked quietly, mostly about Japan. But the Americans had other ideas about our small gathering. What had turned out to be a quiet few hours ended up in a mad dash for the shelters, the other pilots carrying me out of the hospital. I gritted my teeth with shame and bitterness. I felt so helpless. Here were the same men whom I had led into combat, and now they were carrying me around like a half-blind, crippled child. I wanted to scream and shout and tear the bandages off my body, but all I could do was to lie there with my eyes tightly closed. Early the next morning I limped slowly to the pier. A barge waited to take me to the flying boat anchored on the water, you, Saburo. Much more than you will ever know, Sasai held my hands tightly in his own. I'm going to miss you, Saburo, much more than you will ever know. Tears started down my cheeks. I could not hold them back. I choked up and could only hold his hands. Sasai withdrew his hands, unbuckled his belt and handed it to me. I stared at the famed engraved roaring tiger, Saburo. This belt was given to me by my father, one for myself and one each for my two brothers-in-law. One of us has already died. I know little of the magic qualities of the silver tiger, but I wish you to keep this buckle and wear it for me. I hope it will help to bring you back here to us, I protested, but to no avail. Sasai would not have it otherwise. He placed the buckle and belt in my pocket, then clasped my hands again. I'll see you again, Saburo. Don't say farewell. We shall meet again, and soon, I hope. He helped me into the barge. In a moment it was chugging toward the waiting plane. Nishizawa, Ota, Yonakawa, Hattori, Nakajima, and all my friends waved from the pier. They were shouting for me to hurry back, to fly with them again. In a few moments they were blurred. I could still see only a few feet with my left eye. I stood as straight as I could on the barge, my right hand raised, as they blurred into dim and unrecognisable forms. Then I cried like a child. There were few passengers in the flying boat myself, an orderly assigned to take care of me on the return trip home, and several war correspondents. We stopped at Truk and Saipan to refuel. It was a long time since I had walked on my home soil. I had no idea of what conditions would be like back in Japan, but I was totally unprepared for the shock of Yokohama. We landed in the Yokohama harbour early Saturday evening. There was little purpose in reporting that night to the hospital, and I went into the city, where I could take a taxicab to my uncle's house in western Tokyo. These people, they had absolutely no idea of what the war really was like. I gaped in astonishment at the bustling crowds, at the bright signs and lights. I could not believe the sounds of battles which raged off the Solomons. I heard nothing but incredible lists of American shipping destroyed, of hundreds of airplanes shot down. The crowd of people in their light and colourful summer clothes stopped outside the stores and the corners where the radios trumpeted. Every time the announcer mentioned another major defeat over the enemy, loud cheers and cries resounded through the streets. The nation was drunk on false victories. It was hard to believe that a destructive war was going on. In the stores I saw that only certain commodities were being rationed, but that the daily necessities of life were available in abundance. I wanted to get out of the city, and quickly, everything at Ley and Rabul seemed so unreal. Could these two separate worlds exist simultaneously? The blood and dying only short hours away by airplane, and the cheering for non-existent victories here at home, I waved down a cab and gave him my uncle's address. We passed through Yokohama and entered Tokyo. Several minutes later a policeman halted the vehicle and stared through the window at me. 
My uniform was bloodstained, and I was still swathed in bandages. What happened to you? he demanded. I've just returned to Japan from the front, I answered sourly. So, he cried, so you were hurt at the battlefront where tell me, and how I'm a pilot, I spat. At Guadalcanal I was shot up in a fight, Guadalcanal. The young policeman's eyes gleamed. We hear a lot about that nowadays. I understand that only yesterday we had a smashing victory over the Americans. The radio said that our navy sank five cruisers, ten transports and ten destroyers. It certainly must have been an exciting spectacle to watch. That was too much. I'm sorry, Sergeant, I snapped at him. But I'm late, I shouted at the driver. Go ahead, at once. Many years had gone by since the first time I had walked into my uncle's home. The house stood unchanged, a link to an era which now seemed a million years in the past. For several minutes I stood on the sidewalk, taking in the familiar structure, the lights, the sounds. A strange feeling of peace descended upon me. My irritation fled, and I opened the door exactly as I had done in my childhood, and, using the same words I had always cried upon entering the house, shouted, Here I am, I'm home. A startled, Who's that? came from the kitchen. I grinned. It was my aunt, it's me, I called back. There was silence for a moment. It's me, Saburo, I shouted in joy. My uncle's voice burst through the house, a startled what. Then they came running out to the portico. For almost a full minute they stared at me. My uncle, my aunt and my two cousins, Hatsuyo and Mikio, unable to speak, stood with their mouths open in astonishment. I returned their gaze patiently as their eyes took in my blood-stained uniform and the bandages. My uncle's voice was a querulous whisper. It really is you, Saburo. I could barely hear his words. It is Saburo. It is not a ghost I am seeing. He strained forward, afraid that I might vanish into thin air. No. It is no ghost, I answered. It is really I. I'm home once again. This was like returning to life. The battles, the dying, the wounds, squeezing the trigger, flicking in rolls to escape pursuing fighters, cowering in the mud of the bomb shelters, all of it fled. All of it became unreal, remote, a shadowy world which never existed but which hung over my shoulder like the ghost my uncle had believed me to be. To sit in a home like this again, to talk with my uncle and aunt, to see Hatsuyo and Michio again, to relax, to know there would be no bombs tonight, no fortresses cruising high above 20,000 feet, no Mitchells and marauders screaming in, no blasting explosions or shrieking fragments of steel or fiery tracers into the billets, it took a long time to relax as the evening wore on. Every now and then I shook my head in amazed happiness over it all. We had so many things to talk about, it was almost three years since I had spent a night with this family. Hatsuyo was no longer the high school girl I remembered. I stared at her, trying to realise that this beautiful young woman really was my same cousin. Even Mikio, a wild boy in the lower grades when I'd gone to high school, was a husky young man. I kept staring at Hatsuyo, trying to catch up with all the years which had passed so strangely, and now that I was seeing them again so quickly. I stayed the night at their home. It was the first night in many years that I had enjoyed a deep and sound sleep. Not even my wounds, which had kept me awake for the last week, disturbed me. The next morning I left by train for Yokosuka. The everyday life of the people in the city seemed even more startling than the night before. The passengers, especially the young girls and women, looked at me only once. They grimaced at my appearance and looked the other way. Their deliberate concentration to avoid looking at the bloody bandages unnerved and enraged me. No longer was I the leading ace of Lei and Raboul, the man whom Captain Saito asked to come back, the pilot who cried with his other flyers. I was a bloody, dirty, and yes, it was true, a distasteful sight to my own people. I was disgusted. No sooner had I reported to the Yokosuka hospital than an orderly took me to the chief surgeon's room. I was puzzled. Today was Sunday. Except for dire emergencies, the chief surgeon would not be on duty. He surprised me by greeting me personally. He smiled at my astonishment. I left word that I was to be notified the moment you showed up, he explained. I've just come from my billet. You see, I received a special letter from Captain Saito of your lay wing, requesting me to do everything possible for you. He looked at me for a moment. 
Captain Saito went to great pains to tell me of what you have done in the Pacific. I understand that you are the leading fighter ace of all our pilots, I nodded. I can well understand your captain's apprehension then. Come, he took my arm. We will begin work on you at once. A few minutes later I was in the operating room. The surgeon scraped off the rotten flesh from my head wound. He worked quickly and surely, and paid no attention to my gasps as the knife cut and scraped along the skull. When he had cleaned out the wound and applied fourteen new stitches, he personally brought me down to the eye department. We have called in the best man in all Japan to work on you, he explained. Dr. Sakano was drafted from his civilian practice into the Navy and is now a lieutenant commander. There is no better eye surgeon in our country. When we heard from Captain Saito, we notified Dr. Sakano to be on call for your arrival. So I was coming to the fateful moment, I would know soon just what the decision was to be, whether I would see again, whether I could take to the air. I tried to think of everything but my eyes, I didn't want to think about it. It was no use. The doctor examined me, several minutes later he stood up. His face was serious and he spoke slowly. There is not a minute to waste, I must operate on your eyes now. Listen to me carefully. Your sight will depend upon what I do to you in the next hour. He paused. Sakai, I cannot apply any anaesthetics. If you wish to see, if you wish me to save at least one of your eyes, you must be prepared to endure all the pain while you are fully awake. I was in a daze. I nodded dumbly, afraid to trust my voice. They placed me on a high bed. Then several orderlies tied me down with straps and ropes. I was unable to move my arms or legs even a fraction of an inch. A strap went across my forehead to keep my head steady, and a nurse clamped her hands against my temples for added safety. The doctor told me to set my eyes on a red lamp hanging from the ceiling. Look at it, Sakai, he warned. Look at it. Never take your eyes away from that light. You are not to blink. You are not to even turn your eyes to the sides. Listen to me carefully. You can blind yourself for life if you do not do exactly as I say. It was horrible. More than that... It was the most frightful pain I had ever known. I had always regarded myself as capable of withstanding great pain. The Bushido Code had taught me patience, perseverance under the most trying conditions, but this... I had to stare at the light, stare at it until I saw only the red bulb, filling everything. Until the doctor's hand swam into view, looming and unreal, the sharp, pointed steel in his hand, bringing it closer and closer and closer, I screamed. More than once I shrieked like a madman with the terrible agony. I felt I could not stand it for another moment. Finally nothing mattered any longer except that the pain be stopped. My desire to fly again, my desire even to see, none of it mattered any more. The pain. Once I screamed at Sakano, Stop, stop it, gouge it out, do anything, only stop it. I tried to squirm away from that knife. I tried to slide under the straps. They were much too tight. The doctor shouted back at me every time I yelled. Shut up, he roared. You must endure this, otherwise you will go blind. Stop your screaming. The torture lasted more than thirty minutes. It seemed a million years to me. It seemed that it would never stop. When it was over, I was too weak even to move a finger. I lay on the bed, sucking in air, helpless, while the chief surgeon leaned over me, trying to comfort me as my chest heaved and I sobbed. For a month I was confined to my hospital bed. I was steeped in misery. Life meant little to me. I dreamed during the day and night of that long flight back to Rabaul, of all the occasions when I could have shoved the stick forward and plunged into the ocean. It would have been only a brief moment of pain. Dr. Sakano visited me often to study my eyes. I did everything I could, he told me, but your right eye will never recover, not fully. You will be able to see things perhaps one or two feet in front of you, but that is all. Your left eye will be perfectly all right. His words were a thundering sentence of death, of living death to me. A fighter pilot with only one eye, I laughed bitterly, and the doctor went away. My head wound healed rapidly, and the doctor permitted me to walk around the hospital. Every week I put in an application to be discharged and sent back to Rabul, and every week the application was rejected. Finally, the chief surgeon personally returned the latest application. He was obviously angry, I tell you, Sakai, he complained. It will be many months before you can even think of returning to Rabaul. My orders are explicit. 
you are to have at least six months convalescence before you can be assigned to any duty here at home or overseas. I felt like a fugitive, a deserter from the battlefront. I thought of all the pilots, of Nishizawa and Ota and Sasai, going out every day in their zeros to engage in battle. I was afraid even to listen to the war news over the radio. It reminded me too much of Rabaul. One day I had visitors. A nurse came into my room. There are visitors downstairs, she said. Would you like to have them come to your room? I had no idea who they could be. It was Thursday, and my cousin Hatsuyo came to see me, bringing flowers for my room each weekend, when she could get away from her job in the munitions factory. I had written my mother not to attempt the long trip from Kyushu, for within the next several weeks I would be transferred to the Sasebo Hospital. Yokosuka was more than 700 miles by rail from Fukuoka in northern Kyushu, where my mother had moved to live with her daughter and son-in-law. But I had not expected these visitors. Two people entered the room. I strained to see them. My eye still was unable to make out faces at a distance of more than six or seven feet. Fujiko-san? I gasped her name. Fujiko, even more beautiful than I had remembered her, stood in the doorway with her father, Professor Niori. I had not seen her since our one meeting more than eighteen months before in Osaka. They bowed to me, and I returned the greeting. Still, we had not spoken except for my crying out her name. The nurse offered them chairs and withdrew. Her father spoke. Hatsuyo-san wrote us that you were at this hospital. How we have worried about you, Saburo-san. It is a great relief to see you again. We feared for your health. It is wonderful that you seem so much better than we believed. I stammered in reply. I had failed to write Fujiko for many months. My apologies were halting and embarrassed, for Fujiko had written me often when I was at Lai, and the mail from home brought many gifts from her. Her father waved away my stammered apologies. It is of no matter, he said. We know of the marvellous things you have done at the front, and we are so proud of you. But now tell us, how are your wounds? Will you be able to leave here soon? I was hit in four places, I answered. The doctors have done a wonderful job, except, I added bitterly, pointing to my right eye, for this, I am blind in this eye, and the doctors say I will remain this way for the rest of my life. My reply startled Fujiko. She jerked her hand to her mouth, her eyes opening wide at what I had said. It's true. All of it, I emphasised. There are no two ways about it. I am disabled. The loss of this eye means the end to my life as a fighter pilot. Professor Niori interrupted. But then won't you be discharged from the Navy? No, no, I do not think so, I replied. The sarcasm welled up in me. You cannot understand this here at home, sir. But the magnitude of this war is beyond your comprehension. I do not think I will be discharged at all. The Navy will find use for me as an instructor, or I will be assigned to some command post duty on the ground. There was a brief silence. It gave me time to reflect that these two people had come more than 500 miles from their home in Tokushima simply to welcome me home, to try and cheer me up. I was behaving disgracefully, and I thanked them deeply for their trouble and their great kindness. Fujiko shook her head at me. She was obviously annoyed at the formality of my voice. She tried to speak, but the words did not come. Finally, she turned quickly to the elderly man at her side and cried, Father! Her eyes were wide and appealing. Professor Niori nodded gravely and cleared his throat. When do you think you will be reassigned? He asked. He looked straight at me. I think we will go ahead with the arrangements for the wedding. That is, of course, if it is all right with you, Saburo-san. What? I croaked. I could not believe his words. The wedding arrangements. My head reeled. I... I beg your pardon, sir? I blurted out. Forgive me, Saburo-san. He answered... I know this is a very clumsy way of bringing this matter before you. Let me say it otherwise. The old professor rose to his feet and spoke solemnly. Saburo-san, will you accept my daughter Fujiko as your bride? We have taken the utmost pains to raise her as a decent woman, and we have taught her to be exemplary in all the necessary and chosen fields. I would be exceedingly happy if you were to accept my offer, and I could be your father-in-law. I could do no more than gasp. His words were like bells ringing in heaven. Fujiko stared at my wide eyes and blushed. She lowered her head and looked into her lap. I tore my eyes away from her and stared at the wall. The irony was bitter. 
How many days had I stared in my despair at that same wall? Finally I regained my voice, but I could hardly talk. My own words choked me. I had to force them out. I hated myself for what I was saying. But there was no way out, Professor Niori. I, sir, I am so greatly honoured to hear your words. They are happiness itself, but I choked and forced back the tears. I, I cannot, I cannot accept your offer. There, it was done. The words were out, I had said it. What? His voice was incredulous. Are, are you already engaged to someone else? No. Oh no, do not even think such a thing, I beg of you. I must decline, but for an entirely different reason. Professor Niori, I can't say yes, it is impossible. Look at me, sir. Look at me, I do not deserve Fujiko-san. Look at my eyes, I cried. I am half blind. Relief swept over his face. Oh come, Saburo-san, you belittle yourself without need. Don't heap abuse upon yourself because you have been wounded. Your wounds are honourable. They bring no disgrace to you. Do you not understand your own position? All Japan acclaims you. They sing your praises. Do you not realise that as the greatest ace of our country you are a national hero? Professor Niori, you do not understand. I am only telling you the truth, sir. The truth you yourself cannot see, I insisted. There is no condescension in my words. A hero is a fleeting thing. He is a creature of the moment. And I am not a hero. I am a flyer who cannot fly. I am a pilot who is half blind. What good am I? Of what use am I any longer hero indeed? You know our country has no individual heroes. He was silent for a while. Perhaps I expressed myself improperly, Saburo-san, he continued. But you must realise that this is not a matter which has been decided upon suddenly. My wife and I took to you immediately upon our first meeting. I understand your feelings, but you must understand one thing above all. My wife and I, as well as Fujiko, believe you are the only man who can make her happy. It is our hope, our trust, that our daughter will do the same for you. I felt as though my heart would break. Could this fine and wonderful man not understand what I was driving at? How can you judge a man at only one meeting? I cried. How can you make this decision with so little to go on? Fujiko-san's entire life, her happiness, all hinges on the one time you have met me. I cannot understand your actions, although no honour ever offered me has been greater than that you brought to me tonight. I spread my arms in exasperation. There must be many other young men for Fujiko-san who are so much better suited than myself. Thousands of them, with all the advantages of complete educations, with more promising futures. What can I offer your daughter, Professor Niori? What can I give her? I beg you again, look at me in another light, look at me. What future do I have as I am now? Fujiko remained quiet no longer. She raised her head and stared at me. I wanted to run from the room. You are wrong, Saburo-san, she said quietly. Oh, you are so wrong, you make too much fuss over your eye. Whether you are half-blind or not matters not at all to me. We are to be wedded as one. The same things in life which lie ahead for any man are yours too. If it be necessary, Saburo-san, if it be necessary, I can be of help. I do not want to marry you merely for the sake of your eyes. You are wrong, Fujiko-san, I replied. I know you are brave, that what you say about yourself is true. But now you are talking from sentiment. You cannot decide your entire life upon passing emotions. No, no, no she repeated, shaking her head. How can you so misunderstand me? This is no fleeting sentiment. Do you not realise that I have dwelt upon this meeting tonight for many months? I know what I am saying. There was no use in continuing the conversation in this fashion. I was afraid that at any moment I would break down. Professor Niori and Fujiko-san, I said with as much authority as I could inject into my voice, I am not trying to belittle you. This is not a matter for bargaining, I repeat, sir. You have bestowed upon me tonight the greatest honour I have ever known. But I cannot accept your magnificent offer. I refuse to allow my emotions to govern my thoughts or actions. I have always been a proud man. I cannot marry Fujiko-san. I cannot accept the honour of marrying this girl whom I do not deserve. That is the reason why I must say no. I will not do this to her. I refused to listen to the professor's words. He pleaded with me but I would only repeat the same words over and over again. Soon Fujiko broke down. She flung herself into her father's arms and wept aloud. I could have killed myself for what I was doing, for the sorrow to which I was subjecting her. But I knew that I was acting properly. 
that what I was doing was for her good. A marriage with me might bring temporary happiness, but in later years it would be Fujiko who would suffer. Nearly an hour later they left the room. I do not know how long I stared at the doorway after them. Then I turned and collapsed, weak and almost helpless, on the bed. That was the worst hour I had ever known, but what else could I have done? A thousand times I asked that question of myself. A thousand times the same answer came back to me. There wasn't any other way out of it, but this realisation did me little good. I had cast aside the most beautiful thing which had ever entered my life. Two days later, Hatsuyo came for her weekly visit. She did not greet me with her usual smile, and did not trouble to conceal her displeasure. How could you have done it, Saburo? she asked as soon as she was at my bedside. How could you have hurt Fujiko so much? Hatsuyo told me that Fujiko had sobbed uncontrollably when she visited Hatsuyo in Tokyo on her return from the hospital. Professor Niori begged my uncle and Hatsuyo to do everything in their power to make me change my mind. Hatsuyo looked eagerly at me. They say, Saburo, that perhaps you acted so because they displeased you with their words. My father and I know their family so well. They are such wonderful people. Why did you do it? she cried. Hatsuyo, please try to understand, I begged of her. You lived with me as a child for several years, and you, of all people, should know me well. As much as I am hurt by what I had to say, I do not regret my decision. I honestly believe that I acted for Fujiko's good, for her own happiness. She rejected my words. They told us that you refused because you had been wounded. You should know better than to say that. It is only part of the reason. I have loved Fujiko with the deepest devotion ever since I first met her. My feelings for her are no less today. My love is no weaker. All through the long months at Lei and at Rabaul, Fujiko was to me woman eternal. Do you too fail to understand? I refused because I do love her. You are not making sense, Saburo, listen to me. Then, during all the time I was overseas, during all the weary months in the Pacific, Fujiko never left my mind. I wanted her to be so proud of me, and I did well. Perhaps this is not the nicest thing to discuss with you, Hatsuyo, but I must be frank. Rabaul was a major military base, and there were more than 10,000 Japanese stationed there at all times. In addition, we often had with us for a while a full division of army troops. What do you think men do when they are away from home, away from their own women? We had brothels at Rabul, just as we have here in Yokosuka, when we went to Rabul for a rest. More than a few of the pilots never even left those brothels. Not all of us, but a great many. But I never did so. My pride would not allow it. I wished to remain as pure in body as was possible for Fujiko when the day came that I could ask her hand in marriage. Before my injury I could have come to her as Sakai, the great ace, the fearless flyer, a man worthy of her hand. But now no, I shouted at Hatsuyo. I will not be pitied. Do you think I could stand to have Fujiko pity me? Never. Now do you understand me? Hatsuyo held my hand tightly and nodded. I know, I know, she whispered. She looked into my eyes. I do know you, Saburo, much better than you realise. I know how badly you want to fly again, but I cannot help feeling sorry for Fujiko. She will be happier for it. She? But Hatsuyo interrupted me by throwing her arms around my neck and hugging me closely. Poor Saburo, have hope. You must have faith. You will fly again. I know you will. In October, the Navy transferred me to the Sasebo Navy Hospital. The change of surroundings was more than welcome, I would be closer to home and could see my family again. By now the torrid summer was gone, and the train ride proved comfortable. I opened the windows wide and soaked in sunshine and the soothing autumn wind. Japan was as beautiful as ever, and now, with autumn colour on the mountains and hills, the passing countryside took on the appearance of a strange and wonderful fairyland. Trees and shrubs lay in crimson splashes on both sides of the tracks, they had turned yellow and scarlet and green and brown in a riot of blending hues. Three hours after we left Yokosuka, Fujiyama swam into view. I will never tire of looking at this most beautiful of all mountains. The graceful lines curved gently to the summit, still uncapped with snow, but half hidden in swirling mist made brilliant by the sun. Fujisan, it reminded me of Fujiko, who was indeed named after the mountain, but who was now equally as remote for me. 
The country lay quietly, at peace. There was no war here, not within the hundreds of farms and paddies which lay neat, clean and prosperous on both sides of the tracks. What war, I saw only what I had always seen, now even more beautiful than when I had viewed it as a younger man. My perspective was different, now I could compare the serenity and dignity of all this with the volcanic misery which was Rabool, the sandy runway gouged out of the jungle at Lai. No wonder an aura of comfort and well-being radiated from my home soil. And yet, I mused, not one of these people, the children, the farmers, young and old, the village elders, the postmen and the police, the merchants, not one of them had crossed Guadalcanal from 20,000 feet and looked down to see the vast ocean alive, teeming with a strange and terrible life, row upon row of American warships and transports, and there were so many more lying over the horizon I had not seen. In this respect, too, my perspective had changed. Our pilots from the lay wing were unique, I had discovered at Rabool. The incredible one-sided margin of victories was by no means shared by other wings, and the army, what of the army, with its pilots who sadly lacked the fine temper of training which we had been afforded, whose planes blundered into enemy entrapments. No longer was I myself inviolate, it had been the enemy's turn then, and no less than a miracle had brought me here on this train as it swayed along the tracks leading to Sasebo. A man sees the war differently after the doctors have scraped away rotten flesh from his skull, have dug jagged steel splinters from his body, and comforted him with the staggering living death sentence. It is not so bad, Sakai, you will be only half blind, only half blind. My mother waited to greet the train at the Fukuoka station. We stopped only briefly, and no through passengers were permitted off the train. I leaned as far out of my window as I could, waving frantically to catch her attention. The joy in her face when she saw me was the most wonderful thing I had known in so many long months. She was older, oh, so much older, now that all her sons had left for war, I shouted to her. I am all right now, I cried. I am all right, mother. Don't worry about me. Everything is all right now. The train was moving again. She stood on the platform, her eyes brimming with tears, slowly waving the rising sun flag, crying, Banzai, Banzai, after me as the train pulled away. The doctors at Sasebo ordered another month's convalescence in the hospital. No longer did I argue with them, implore them to return me to Rabaul. I felt drained out. I cared little what their orders might be. The month passed slowly, but my first weekend was gladdened by a visit from my mother. She was still the same wonderful woman, Convinced that what I needed best were the favourite foods of my childhood, she had cooked an entire meal to bring along with her. I feared the moment when I would have to tell her of losing the sight of my right eye. To my astonishment, she did not appear upset at the news. It does not make you any less a man, my son, she said calmly, and that closed the subject for her. She offered to come every weekend. It would have been wonderful to see her so often, but I begged her not to. She was old and no longer could stand the arduous rail journey. Train travel was becoming more and more difficult, with war material taking up so much space, passenger accommodations were restricted, and at best were acutely uncomfortable. In November there occurred an event which, under any other circumstances, would have been one of the greatest moments in my life. Now it meant little. Orders were received by the hospital promoting me to the rank of warrant officer, the long climb upward from a recruit seaman, with its brutal discipline and endless punishment, was ended. Step by step I had forged my way through the ranks, and now the reward had come. It was a hollow victory, but it had its compensations. My new status meant I could complete my convalescence at home. I snatched at the surgeon's offer and left at once for the Fukuoka suburbs, where I joined my family. The next month was wonderful. It was the first time in ten years I had spent thirty consecutive days with my mother, and her happiness was a joy to behold. Everything was quiet and peaceful. Almost every day my mother asked, When do you think the war will be over, Saburo? I knew she had in mind my two brothers who were now overseas, and every time she asked I could only tell her the truth. I did not know. Then she would look around to be sure no other person was within earshot. Saburo, tell me she implored in a half-whisper. Are we really winning? Is everything they tell us true? 
Again, I could only repeat, we must win, but she was happy, there was no denying that. I knew that she wished there was some way my convalescence period could be made to continue indefinitely. Several weeks after I arrived at my sister's home, I had a visitor from Tokyo, a news correspondent sent by the Yomuri Shimbun, one of the largest newspapers in Japan. He told me his paper had sent him down from Tokyo to get an exclusive interview with Japan's leading ace. I wondered how many enemy planes Nishizawa and Ota had shot down by now. I was sure they had surpassed my own victories. The entire country wanted to read my own words on the war. I questioned my liberty to talk to this man. Disciplinary action could be swift and harsh if I spoke out of turn. I called the administration officer at Sasebo and told him my problem. He was evasive and insisted there were no specific regulations in the matter. I have no authority to discourage you from talking with a reporter, he concluded. But I must remind you that your conversation will be entirely at your own discretion and that you may be held responsible for anything you say. Also, bear in mind that this desk neither approves nor disapproves of any officer giving an interview. Just be careful, that was certainly a negative reply. I returned to my room and told the correspondent that my superiors did not favour the interview he requested, but he would not be shaken so easily.